Thanks, guys. Amen. Well, say everybody say the Lord is good to me. His loving kindness. His mercy to me is everlasting. Aren't you glad he's a, he's a kind God, full of kindness and compassion toward us, and his mercies are new every morning? Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Good job, Caleb. Praise God. Pastor John and Miss Sheila. John is on the board of a, of a Pastor Josh up in North Carolina, and he is actually preaching for them this morning, and then this is their annual board meeting. So that's where they are at, praise God. But we are glad you are with us. We are glad you are with us online. Always good to see you. Praise God. We believe the Lord has good things for us to hear this morning. Can you say amen? amen. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him keep on hearing, in other words. Praise God. And then, then you know, Jesus said, pay attention to what you hear. But then in another gospel, it says, pay attention to how you hear. Because the way you hear determines how much more you're going to get. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. A hallelujah. Well, we're going to begin this morning in 1 John. 1 John. 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. These three books were written to believers. Amen. Glory to God. And in 1 John chapter 1, let's just begin with verse number 4. It says, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So everything he's about to say to us, throughout the whole book, but particularly in this first part of it, is so that our joy may be full. This is the message which you have heard from him, and, and we declare to you that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship, not relationship, but if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we, John includes himself, he's talking about himself, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Amen. So if, there's, so if you don't have fellowship with somebody, then you're not walking in the light. Amen. I mean, that's, that's one aspect of this. Not the main point, but that's one aspect of this. Doesn't mean you're buddy-buddy with them and best friends with them. But if you're holding something against somebody and just feel like, ah, I can't even stand that. No, if you can't, you know, at least love them and be polite to them and kind to them, you know. But if we say we have fellowship, verse 7 again, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Chapter 2, verse number 1, my little children. Do you think John would write to sinners and say, my little children? My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, if you do sin, we have an advocate, a counselor, a lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the sin offering, the sacrifice offering for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Amen. You know, as believers... Glory to God. We have a relationship with the Father. Amen. We are, we are His children. He is our Father. And we are in right standing with Almighty God. We are righteous. We are in right standing with Him, justified because of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. And that happened not when we confessed our sins. We repented of our sins. But that happened when we confessed Jesus as Lord of our life. We, we took him as our Lord and Savior. We accepted him as our, as our Lord and Savior. Amen. But here it says, if you want to maintain your fellowship. See, there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. If you want to maintain your fellowship with the Father, you need to walk in the light. The light of the truth, you know. You found in God's Word. That's the truth. That's the light walking in God's Word. I have cousins that I have a relationship and I have, I have a, a relationship with. They're always my cousins. And I... I you know, I, I have fond memories of growing up and going to my grandparents' farm. Just had a 50-acre farm, but my uncle next to that had a 200-acre farm. And across the street from that was a 1,000-acre was a farm that nobody to this day knows who owns. So we ran that like it was ours. And then there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres all around that. So I had cousins, you know, some of them were a year or two younger than I was. Some of them were five or six years younger, older than I was. And some of them were about my age just, or just one or two years older. And so we, we would run the farm. We played together as kids as we grew up. We, 
We, we fellowshiped together. You know, we, had a, we hunted together. We fished together. We played together. We got in trouble together and uh, did all kind of crazy things, you know, shooting rats out of the barn and all that kind of stuff and uh, shooting my grandfather's hogs with our BB guns. You did not want to be in the field with my grandfather's hogs. They were mean, probably because we shot them with BB guns. <laughs> And it was always a little bit challenging because my grandparents had an outhouse. They, the, my grandfather had an outhouse until the day he died. My grandmother, the last few years of her house, we did build her on the outside front porch. There was a, a sink and a bathroom that, you know, everybody got together and put in her house. But, you know, that outhouse, you had to, you had to go through a gate to get to the field. And it was about 50 yards out in that field. So it's, it's 100 yards from the house. And uh, most of the time, it was, you know, them hogs weren't in that field. But at a certain time of year, my grandfather would let those hogs loose in the field. And so you had to go out there to the outhouse and, and traverse that 50 yards, keeping your eye out for them hogs. <laughs> he had one big red one, you know. When they killed it, it weighed almost 500 pounds. And he had two big old husks, and one of them was half broke off. He was, he's a mean looking dude, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway... As I got older, I found out, well, my father actually never even used the outhouse, but <laughs> just did other things. But, uh, you know, a couple of those cousins, you know, my aunts and uncles, we went to their house. Some of them came, they came a lot of them came to our house because I grew up in Florida. They like to come to Florida, you know, because we live near the beach. And, and we, we camped, particularly with one cousin, and he had uh, four cousins I had there that were all relatively close to my age. So they're, they're my cousins, and we had a lot of fellowship together, you know. And we, we, we enjoyed that. They're still my cousins, but most of them, it's been over 50 years, and I've had little to zero fellowship with them. Amen? Because, you know, we got older, and they got married, and I got married, and we had kids, and we had grandkids, and, and some of us had great, great grandkids, and several of these cousins of mine, some of them younger, some of them older, have, have, have already passed away. And uh, except for an occasional funeral here and there, most of them I haven't, I haven't seen at all in literally 50 years. Very, I mean, just one or two times. But I still have those memories. But, but we don't have any fellowship at all together because we never see each other. But they're still my cousins. They'll always be my cousins. I'm related to them. They are my cousins. Well, John says, even though God is your father, you have a relationship with him. If you've been born again, he is your father. If you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, God is your father. Amen. And he's your father, he, he, and even though you, you walk in darkness and have unconfessed sins in your life. But when you have unconfessed sins in your life, and you're not walking in the light, you know, then you break fellowship with the father. You see, you're still related to him, but you have no fellowship with him. As Christians, we should walk in the light and maintain our fellowship with the father at all times. Can you say amen? amen. And if we sin, if we miss it, and Christians do sin and Christians do miss it. So you have to understand that the Bible talks about, you know, sinners sinning, but it also talks about Christians sinning. And, and the way you deal with it is different for, you know, it's all wrapped up in the blood of Jesus, but, but it's dealt with in a different way. And so if we sin, we shouldn't ignore our sin. We shouldn't excuse our sin. We shouldn't, we shouldn't justify our sin or just fail to deal with it because, you know, we're, we're just, we're just, we're just, not as committed as we should be. We're not as consecrated as we should be. We become lukewarm in our relationship with God. And, and that's, that's one of the main reasons people don't confess their sins. But that's not the only reason. The other side of the coin here, and this, this is a big, big deal. That, that there are people that, that, that the reason they don't confess their sins, it's not a lack of consecration. It's not a lack of, of love for God. They just, they just feel so horrible when they sin. And they just beat themselves up and they, they wallow in, in condemnation and, and they run from God because they feel so worthy and so guilty and so, you know, j just like, how could God forgive me? I, I confess that same sin 15 times, 20 times, maybe a whole, whole lot more. And, you know, and the devil jumps on them with both feet and said, that's right. Look at you, you, you ugly thing. You're probably not even saved. You know, and so they just, they just always tell people when you sin, don't run from God, but run to God. Hallelujah. I, I was reading this morning, you know, that, that, that scripture in Hebrews. 
uh, where it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. This is written to Christians, and this is Christians who need grace, who need mercy. Why do you need grace? Why do you need mercy, even as a Christian? Because you've blown it some kind of way. You, you've missed it in some kind of way. So the Amplified says, let us with privilege approach the throne of grace, that is the throne of God's gracious favor, with confidence, without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help in time of need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. Glory to God. So, you know, because people, sometimes people don't, don't confess their sins and and, 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 you know, then they end up just, that, that was my testimony growing up. You know, I just, I just felt horrible. I just felt terrible. And I, so I didn't, I didn't walk in the light. I didn't maintain my fellowship with God. I didn't turn to God and ask God to forgive me of my sin. I just wallowed in condemnation and wallowed in the mud of, of guilt and, and feeling ashamed, which is exactly what the devil wanted me to do, not what God wanted me to do. God wanted me to, to confess my sin and get forgiveness and cleansing and be restored and get back into right fellowship because when you're in right fellowship, then you grow and you mature and, and you learn and you keep the door shut on the devil. And as you do all those things, you just get stronger and stronger in the Lord. But I just wallowed in, in, in all that guilt and felt useless and didn't think that God loved me very much and God could never use me. God could never bless me. God couldn't just keep forgiving me again and again and again and again and again for the same old things. I've blown it so much, I might as well just, just, just keep on sinning. I might as well just, just stay away from God. And that's what the devil wants people to do. No, that's not what we should do. What should we do? We should confess our sin to, to God and receive, not earn. Everybody say receive, not earn. Receive, not earn. We should confess our sin to God and receive, not earn, but receive forgiveness and cleansing from our sin. And then we should forgive ourselves. Hallelujah. We should realize that God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And the blood of Jesus is more powerful than, than, than our sin could ever be. We, we should forgive ourselves. We should pick ourselves up. We should go right on with God and move forward totally free from guilt and shame and condemnation because God is faithful and his blood is more powerful than our sin. Can you say amen? And you know, you don't have to beg God to forgive you. You don't have to bargain with God to forgive you. You don't have to say, God, you know, I'll do this and this and this. That's not why God forgives you because you make promises. He forgives you because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't have to, to grovel and beg and beat yourself up. And, and then after you beat yourself up for a number of days and you say, okay, now God can forgive me because I paid the price for my sin. No, you didn't pay the price for your sin. Jesus paid the price for your sin. Amen. You know, in, in, in the Philippines, they walk around and they, they hit themselves or whip themselves or beat themselves with a stick. You just see them walk around hitting themselves with a stick. Well, they're trying to, they're trying to pay for their sins, you see. Well, Christians do the same thing when they, when, they, when they say, no, God can never use me. I gotta be miserable for four days and, or I gotta be, you know, not blessed for four days or, or feel, be ashamed for four days. No, that, that's, that's walking around hitting yourself with a stick. Amen. And, and, and uh, see, he doesn't forgive us because we grovel and beat ourselves up. We don't confess our sins so God will love us again. He always loves us. We simply acknowledge. The word confess just means to agree with or say the same thing. We acknowledge, we agree with God. We missed it. We repent of it with a godly sorrow. Paul said, you know, in writing to the Corinthians, he said, listen, it, it, it kind of broke my heart that I had to correct you. And I was, I, you know, and it made you sorrowful. But it was a good thing because that godly sorrow calls you to repent. Now that's the Apostle Paul. I think he knows something about God, don't you? <laughs> that's really God. Th and the Apostle Paul is telling Christians to repent. Yeah. Are you listening to me? Now there's a reason he's, he's doing that because he wants you to get back under, he wants you to get back under grace. He wants you to get back under God's provision and God's protection and not give the devil inroads into your life. Praise God. Amen. Uh, Andrew Womack points out in, in this verse, in his commentary in 1.9, he said, you know, what happens when you sin is God still loves you. Uh, you. You still have a relationship with God, but your sin gives the devil inroads into your life. And God doesn't want the devil to have any inro inroads to, to not just attack you, but to defeat you. 
Anybody can be attacked, but it's another thing to be defeated. And so he, he doesn't want the devil to have inroads into your life. And we confess our sins. That's one of the things that happened. We stop the, the Satan, Satan from having inroads into our life. So we simply acknowledge, we repent, we by faith receive forgiveness and cleansing, and that's freely offered by God, and we stay in the light, and we keep the door closed to the devil in our lives. That is grace in action. That doesn't violate the grace of God. That's grace in action. Amen. So when a Christian repents and confesses his sin and says, I'm sorry, I missed it, forgive me, Father, he doesn't violate the grace of God. He takes advantage of it. Amen. Reverend Tony Cook said, God's grace in the, death, in the death of Jesus on the cross makes repentance possible, not unnecessary. Talking about Christians, to Christians. God's grace in the death of Jesus on the cross makes repentance possible for the Christian. Makes repentance possible, not unnecessary. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, you know, healing belongs to us. You know that, don't you? Glory. But healing is not automatically yours. It belongs to you, but it's not automatically yours. You have to, by faith, receive that particular grace. Same thing when it comes for forgiveness for the Christian. It's available to every Christian because of what Jesus did for us at Calvary. It belongs to us, but it does have to be received by faith. And as another minister said, forgiveness is not received by the believer until it's received by the believer. Amen. And then, you know, some people come along and they try to claim that 1 John 1, 9 is, a, is an isolated one-off scripture. You know, one-off, don't you? That's what they, we used to say. It's just, just a one, how did we used to say it when I was a kid? We didn't say one-off. We said it's just a one-time deal. But you know, you say one-off. In other words, this is the only scripture in the whole Bible that ever tells Christians or believers or the children of God that they should repent or confess their sins. That is the stupidest thing anybody has ever said. Just look up the word repent, amen, in your concordance and see, and see how many times in the New Testament letters to the church, Christians are told to repent. And there's a reason for it, amen. And so this scripture is very, very powerful in and of itself. But then, for instance, Proverbs 28, 13, many scriptures tell Christians to confess their sins or to repent of their sins. Proverbs 28, 13 says, how many of you believe Proverbs applies to you? Amen. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them. And I, I like a lot of other translations that say and forsake them says this, whoever confesses and renounces them. Because that's really the idea there. I think people think, well, I, I, you know, I, I did it again. I did it again. That's not what he's talking about. When, when you confess it and you're sorry for it and you're renouncing it, th then it says you will have mercy. Glory to God. Now, understand. So we see this. But notice why you should do it. Why should you should acknowledge? Why should you agree with God? Why should you confess or denounce your sin? So that you will have mercy so that you will continue to prosper. I mean, if you don't, you won't prosper, he says, and you won't have mercy. Amen. So that, that, that's the purpose of it. A glory to God so that we'll have mercy and so that we will prosper. It's very interesting in Acts chapter 19 because there, there's a, you know, here's homework for you. Just read Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is where Paul goes to Ephesus. Now, Paul has a mighty, mighty, mighty move of God in Ephesus. Ephesus was a, was a large city, big metropolitan city. It was a city full of idol worship. Uh, it, was, it was a city full of all kinds of false gods. And it was noted and known for the, uh, its occult practices. In other words, they had all kinds of charms and amulets they would wear to ward off evil spirits and to keep them safe. In the city of, of, of Ephesus, uh, they practiced the occult and sorcery and magic and witchcraft, you know, all of that, all demonic activities of all kind of times. And it was kind of, it was kind of, you know, the capital of that in the, in the old world of witchcraft and the occult. But how many of you know the power of God is much, 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 much greater than the power of the devil? And so Paul has a great revival there. And out of that revival in this hotbed of the occults with all these false worship and false gods and idol worship and so forth, we have the great uh, church of Ephesus that is born. Ephesus was, in the early church, it was the largest church by far of all the churches. 
you know, somewhere around 100,000 members or more. And so we had, we had the, the church of Ephesus pastored by Timothy, glory to God. This is where the Bible says in Ephesians, uh, in Acts chapter 19, rather, it says God worked unusual, unusual or extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul, that even the handkerchiefs that were taken where Paul were laid on the sick and they were healed. And so Paul was obviously having great results there. And this great church was, came out of that city, of, in, a powerful church, influential church. Paul was casting out devils there. And so it says these, these seven sons of Schema tried to cast the devil out of a man. Amen. And so uh, they, they saw this man. He's possessed of the devil. They're probably kind of using, we don't, it's not told in scriptures, but they're probably trying to use some of their, they're mixing Christianity and probably trying to use some of their witchcraft and magic with that. But this is what the Bible does tell us. It says, they, it said, we call on the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And that's what they were doing to try to exercise, the Bible says, this demon out of this man. And so <laughs> the evil spirit said through the man, he said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who are you? And then it says he, he, he jumped on them, seven of them, beat them all up, stripped them of their clothes, and they ran out and ran off naked. I love it. Paul I know, Jesus I know, but I don't know you guys. You guys don't have any authority and power over me. Now I said all that to you because... Here in the city of Ephesus, you know, Ephesus, Acts chapter 19 starts with these believers, these, these guys, these disciples that Paul meets and he gets them filled with the Holy Ghost. And so the church of Ephesus has started there. And so, you know, just like people are today, people are influenced if they're not careful, if they don't renew their mind to the truth of God's word, they're influenced by the society and culture in which they live in. And so it's quite obvious this was a city of the occult and magic and witchcraft. It's quite obvious that they were, they were influenced by their city because it says, and it makes it real clear, it says, they that had believed came confessing their deeds and they brought out all their occult books and magic books and burned them. And so these people had gotten saved but they, you know, grew up in this city and grew up in this culture and they're influenced by it. So they're still playing around with some magic stuff and witchcraft stuff and some demonic stuff. And it says, they that had believed confessed. These are believers. These believers confessed their sin. Glory to God. James 5, 16 told believers who needed to do this. This only applies to certain situations. People who are sick because uh, of sin. But he says, he said, confess your faults one to another with the results that you may be healed. And of course, there's other scriptures where Paul told the, the Corinthians, repent, you know, turn from, you, you, in other words, you're doing something wrong. But, but if nothing else, Jesus told the believers, everybody say believers, in the New Testament churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Pergamos, and Laodicea. That's one, two, three, four, five, seven churches. But in five of the churches, you know, John wrote to those churches in the book of Revelation, New Testament churches, Christians just like you and I. Jesus had a message for those churches. And five of those churches, he told those believers to repent. Jesus told believers to repent. If that doesn't settle the question for you, then I can't help you. Amen. Not repenting would result in negative consequences. That's why he wanted to, them to confess their sin. That's why he wanted them to repent because he wanted them to stay in fellowship with him. He didn't want the door to be open, the, the, the door to the devil be open in their life. He didn't want sin, which always produces death in some form, sickness, disease, depression, fear, guilt. He didn't want that to happen in their lives. Glory to God. Acknowledging that they were wrong and repenting calls them to continue to walk in the light, to continue to be blessed and to be useful in God's kingdom and to be a blessing to others and protected from the devil. That's why God wants people, Christians, when they sin, to confess their sin. Glory to God and has made marvelous provision for that. Paul told believers in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31, this is believers, he had just told them, he said, look, for this cause. One of those causes is because they were walking in strife and unforgiveness and bitterness and not walking in love toward one another. He said, for this cause, there are many that are weak, there are many that are sickly, and there are many that have died prematurely. That's Christians in the body of Christ. But then he says, right after that, he says, but if we would judge ourselves, 
How do you judge yourself? I'm wrong. I admit it. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I, I, I know God wants me to do this and I hadn't been obeying that. I know he wants me to give this up and I haven't been doing it. You know, that's how you judge yourself. You admit, you confess, you acknowledge. That's what the word confess means. You acknowledge it's wrong. You confess it's wrong. You agree with God that it's wrong. And if we would judge ourselves, we would never be judged. We would not be judged. Glory to God. Amen. And when we do that, then we shut the door on the devil and we stop those inroads from, that he has in our lives because of sin. Amen. Of course, there was that one man in Corinth. You remember him. He had his father's wife, evidently his stepmother. And, and Paul said, he said, you know, hey guys, at least in his day, he said, even the world doesn't do this kind of stupid stuff. And, and you're boastful and proud about how spiritual are you are. And so because the man wouldn't repent, he was turned over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, which was in itself an act of love, so that his spirit would not be condemned or lost totally in the end. He'd still go to heaven. But he was turned over to Satan, to Satan, for the destruction of his flesh. Well, whatever happened, I don't know what happened, but whatever happened to him in his flesh wasn't good. And he obviously repented because in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians you know, Paul said, forgive the man and welcome him back into the fellowship. Glory to God. So there's many more scriptures. So it's really incredibly unscriptural to say that believers don't need to acknowledge and confess their sins or repent of them if and when they miss it. So it's wrong to teach. There's two things that are wrong here. Number one is people teach that it's unnecessary for believers to confess their sins. Because, as the teaching goes, Jesus bore all your sin, past, present, and future, on the cross. They've all been dealt with, and God doesn't ever see any sin in the life of a believer. There's no sin in the life of a believer that has to be dealt with, but that's wrong. Jesus never sees you as a sinner again, but he definitely sees it if you make a mistake and sin. That's why he told, the, that's why he told those churches in, in the book of Revelation, he said, I see what you're doing. You're doing wrong. And you remember, he even told that, that, that woman that was, you know, Jezebel. He said, I gave her space to repent. He's got great mercy. He said, she, she's got space. I'm giving her space. I want her to repent. I don't want her to suffer. I don't want the devil to take advantage of her. I don't want her to miss out on, on, on heavenly rewards because she's living in this wrong state. No, I give her space to repent. Glory to God. That's an act of love. But God definitely does see, so God definitely does see in the life of a believer, sin in the life of a believer, and he knows that sin, that unconfessed sin, practice sin, opens the door to, to the devil to afflict us and rob us of blessings and make us unfruitful in his kingdom and hinder our faith and prayers. So in Revelation, you know, as you read that, he told the one church, he said, as many as I love, I rebuke, I chasten. Therefore, be zealous to repent. Now we understand that God is not chastening us with sickness and disease and, and, and poverty and lack and, and all, you know, we're not, we're not chastened with anything that Jesus redeemed us from when he died on the cross. He chastens us and corrects us with his word. Glory to God and tells us that we're wrong. And so he says, I, I'm telling you that you're wrong. I'm, I'm rebuking you because I love you. Therefore, be zealous to repent. Because when we repent, oh, this, see, can you see this? This is grace. When we repent, when we confess it, he can forgive us. He can cleanse us. He can deliver us. He can stop the devil's accusations against us. And he can stop the devil's ability to defeat us in some way. Can you see that? That's grace. That's grace. That's amazing grace. And that's why he tells us, even as believers, to confess our sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing if we need it. Glory to God. So it's very necessary for Christians when they sin to repent and to get back in the light. Get back in fellowship with God. And then another thing people wrongly say about this passage that it only applies to sinners. I know, you know, you go back to the last, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, you'll see a lot of gospel tracts and they'll use 1 John 1, 9 as a, as a scripture to give to sinners. Go confess your sinners. Don't confess all their sins. They can't even remember all the sins they committed. They confess Jesus as Lord. They acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Amen. They repent of their sins, but then they turn to God. But the, the confession that causes salvation to come into their life is they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is now my Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So this is not a salvation scripture. You can, you can see that obviously just from the context. 
Amen. But watch this, watch this. Here's what happens. We've alluded to it several times, but here's what specifically happens to a Christians who are living in sin. You know, I'm not talking about you make a mistake and you ask God to forgive you. You got space to repent. You, you, you mess up. You say something to your wife you shouldn't say. You, you realize you, you meet somebody on the street and you realize you've got some hard feelings toward them, you know, and, and, and you confess. And I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about a Christian who's, who's practicing sin, who's living in sin, to say it another way, who has unconfessed sin in their lives that they haven't repented of. Amen. And they, they won't admit it. They won't acknowledge it for whatever reason. They're not walking in the light. What happens? What happens specifically to them? Well, they break fellowship with the Father. Number two, they lose the joy of their salvation. He said, I'm writing these things to you so that you'll have joy. Well, when you're in a backslidden condition or not walking in the light or have unconfessed sin in your life, then you just lose the joy of your salvation. Ask me how I know. Glory to God, I've been to church many times sitting there with unconfessed sins in my life and just, you know, God was moving and great things were going on, but I just felt miserable and I just felt horrible, you know, because, uh, you know, God's not condemning me, but, the, but my spirit and the Holy Spirit are convicting me of the sin. See, the Holy Spirit will say, look, what you're doing is wrong and that wrong attitude, that, that sin will come back to haunt you, it will come back to hurt you in some way. I love you and he will woo you back to the Lord Jesus. Condemnation is from the devil and it won't, just, it won't say what you did was wrong. It'll say, you are no good. You are unworthy. You might as well just, just backslide. You, you smoked a cigarette, so just go ahead and get drunk too. You know, that's, that's what the devil will tell you. <laughs> you, know? you might as well just walk away from God. You can't live it. You're, you're nothing. You're no good. No, that's condemnation. But, but you lose the joy of your salvation. And in that position of, of, of broken fellowship, spiritual growth and development is stunted. I'm just preaching to you, not teaching now, but I, I'm just telling you something. Spiritual growth and development is stunted. Uh, you block yourself from receiving God's blessings and you give place to the devil to afflict you. And sooner or later, sooner, this is what confuses people. See, God says I give people space to repent. Sooner or later, just like, just like we see people in the Old Testament, just like David with Bathsheba, didn't happen overnight. It's, it's a year later when the prophet Nathaniel goes to him or Nathan goes to him. You know, but sooner or later, sooner or later, you know, if you don't repent of your sins, then the devil's going to take advantage of you, advantage of you sooner or later. So in this state, a person is still saved, but now they're, they're carnal. They're under the control of their flesh. The Spirit of God's not controlling their life. Their flesh is controlling their life. And the devil has inroads into their life to defeat him. And, and they, they, they live, and if somebody lives most of their Christian life in this state, and a lot of Christians do, they forfeit eternal rewards. And they're certainly not much of a help or a blessing to others in this life. You know, the prodigal son. What is the prodigal son? The prodigal son is not a type of a sinner. The prodigal son is a type of a backslidden Christian. He returned to his father's house. And when, we, when he returned, what, what did he do? He said, he said, I missed it. I blew it. I messed up and instantly he was forgiven and restored. Glory to God. But when he was in his backslidden condition, you know, in his particular case, he ended up broke, hungry, and miserable. Imagine a Jew feeding pigs. Just think about that and all that that means. <laughs> Amen. And so people end up being miserable or suffering in some form or another. But now here's something we need to distinguish and, 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 and realize the difference. And we'll it'll take a couple of minutes and we'll close with this. We talk about giving the devil no place in our lives. You know, give the devil no place. You know, Ephesians 4 says, says understood subject of the sin, it says you, and it says don't you give the devil any place in your life. Well, that means it's possible. If it wasn't possible, there'd be no need to tell us, give no place to the devil. So it is possible for a Christian to give place to the devil. Isn't that right? Amen. So, so, so listen, here's what you need to understand something. Just because you're attacked doesn't mean you're giving place to the devil. Anybody can be attacked. Just like God's people in the Old Testament were attacked. They weren't doing anything wrong. They had a covenant. With, now sometimes they, they were attacked and defeated because they were doing things wrong. But at times they were attacked and God wonderfully and mightily delivered them. And that's what I'm saying. There's a difference in being attacked and being defeated. Are you following me? See, anybody can be attacked by the devil, but if we're walking in the light and we know what belongs to us in Christ, 
We know how to use our authority. We know how to appropriate the promises of God by faith. And we use our authority. Then the devil cannot defeat us. But if we're not walking in the light, not walking in love, living in sin, won't repent, won't, won't confess it, not only can the devil attack us, but he can also defeat us. We need to understand the difference in that. When, when we sin, we step out from under God's umbrella of protection. We're, we're walking in the light, see? We're under God's umbrella of protection. The devil can't get to us. I mean, he can attack us, but he can't defeat us unless we allow him to. Glory to God. But we're walking under the umbrella of God's protection. When you sin, you step out from under God's umbrella of protection. Now you're over on the devil's territory where he has inroads into your life, not just to attack you, but to attack you and defeat you. All right? You follow that? Amen. And so, and so uh, and, and you see, your, your faith won't work over here. Your prayers won't work over here. Glory to God. So, so we think of Jesus and the disciples, many stories, but you remember when Jesus and his disciples were, were in the Sea of Galilee and they faced a great windstorm. You know, the Amplified Bible says, and a fierce windstorm began to blow and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already being swamped. And then it makes a footnote that says, the Sea of Galilee is famous for its sudden and severe storm, seven and a half miles wide. So when you're out there three miles, you know, in the middle of that thing, it's just like being in the ocean. And so it's famous for a sudden and severe storms produced by winds that funnel through the passes and canyons of the surrounding hills. You know, sometimes on the Weather Channel, just for effect, those guys will get in between two buildings because the wind will be much stronger there, you know, because it's funneling through there and they're standing there holding their mic. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. For effect. Well, so, so this was a sudden, unexplained storm. And, and you know, it goes on to say... Uh, the disciples woke him and said, Jesus, we're about to perish. Let me give you a better translation. Jesus, we're dying. We're going to die right here. You know, some of them are professional fishermen. We're in this storm and we're about to die. So this is serious. Everybody say, this is serious. Well, you know, this was a literal storm, but you know as well as I do that, that storms in the Bible are representative many times of the storms of life that we all go through. Temptations, tests, trials, where the devil is trying to, to, he comes to steal and kill and destroy. So he comes and attacks our body with sickness or he attacks our business or attacks our family or attacks our mental state or, or tries to rob us of finances. You know, that, that's a storm of life. Amen. And so, uh, but, but here in this story, Jesus and the disciples are walking in the perfect will of God. Jesus told the disciples to go to the other side. That's another story, but it's, you know, same kind of deal to go to the other. In other words, they're not, they're, they're obeying God. They're doing what God has called them to do. And we know that Jesus is <laughs> never sinned. Amen. So in other words, he's not given the devil any inroads into his life, but he still came under attack. And of course, there are many, 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 many scriptures along these lines. You know, even in the great Psalm 91, which is a psalm about protection, it says, I will be with him in trouble. Doesn't say you will never have any trouble, but I will be with him in trouble. Not to hold your hand and pat you on the head and comfort you while the devil beats your brains in, but I will be with you in trouble to deliver you, the next verse says. Glory to God. So when trouble comes, amen, amen, just because we're in this world and have an enemy, glory to God, it's not because we did anything wrong, it's just because we have an enemy, just because we, that we have the devil to deal with. So it would be wrong to accuse Jesus of missing it in some way because he was attacked. Can you imagine after they got to the other side, you know, that, that uh, Peter and James, and let's just say James. James walked up to Jesus and goes, you know, I don't understand this, Jesus. Um, why, why were we attacked out there? What did we do to open the door to the devil in our lives? Well, why did the devil have the right to bring that storm? How did we miss it? That's, that, that, that's crazy, isn't it? They didn't miss it. They didn't do anything wrong. They just came under attack. And as long as you use your authority and use your faith, amen, then, then you overcome and you're victorious. Glory to God. They didn't open the door to the devil in any way. So anybody can face a storm of life. But like Jesus told his disciples, you know, because he, he, said, he said, you know, he said, listen, you guys need to stay out of fear and you need to use your faith and rebuke the devil. Rebuke sickness, rebuke lack, rebuke the wrong thought and then walk in victory, glory to God. So we get that, we get that, okay? A lot of scriptures, a lot of scriptures, but you get it. On the other hand, 
you remember that Jonah found himself in a literal storm. But storms represent the storms of life we all. Jonah found himself in a literal storm because he disobeyed God. So here's your homework for the week. Read Acts chapter 19 and read, then read the book of Jonah. Jonah only has four short chapters. It may surprise you. You know that Jonah disobeyed God. He did not want to go to the city and preach to them. But if you don't know, it'll really shock you and surprise you as to why he didn't want to go there. And so, so but anyway, Jonah's running from God, you know, and... Uh, you know, God's not going to finance your cruise ship vacation when you're running from him. <laughs> your faith's not going to work. He disobeyed God. Amen. And so, and so what happens is, you know, Jesus was asleep in the boat. Did you know Jonah was asleep in the boat when you read that story? He was in the, the, the belly of the boat, you know, the bottom part of the boat, and he was asleep. But not because he was in faith. And so the sailors, they went down there and they kind of kicked him. My paraphrase and said, get out, boy. Get up here and call on your God. What's the matter with you? Call on your God like we're calling on our gods and maybe he'll stop this storm because, you know, they're, they're obviously facing a, a life-threatening situation. And so this is what Jonah did not do. Or Jonah could have done this. Jonah could have went upstairs and said, all right, boys, got on the front of the deck, you know, kind of like that scene in, in, in uh, the Poseidon, well, not Poseidon, the Titanic, you know, could have got up there at the front of the ship and said, everybody back off, everybody back away. I'm a servant of the Most High God. I'm a prophet. I serve the, tr you guys got all your false gods. I serve the true and living God. I'm going to prove it to you. I got a covenant with God. And, and so I'm, and he could have said, I rebuke these winds and I rebuke these seas. I command you to be peaceful and be still. And you know what would have happened? Nothing. Nothing. Because Jonah's, under those conditions, Jonah's faith wouldn't work. He was in disobedience to God. He, 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 was, he was not doing what God told him to do. He was running from God. Amen. And so, so things got worse and, and they didn't want to do it, but they kind of, you know, and as their custom was, they drew straws as to who's the, responsible for this and it fell on Jonah. So now they know Jonah's the culprit. So they said, they said, what should we do? And so here's Jonah's, here's Jonah's response. Throw me overboard and, and you guys will be okay. How about, let me repent and confess my sin and ask God to forgive me and tell him I'll obey. No, he said, throw me overboard. That's, that's, what, that's what a sin will do to you, make you think stupid. And be stupid. And then, so they threw him overboard, saved their lives, but then a great fish came along and swallowed Jonah. Now, this isn't like children's church where you, you go pick up your kid from children's church today and they show you a picture of Jonah and the whale and, and you know, and here's, here Jonah is, the prophet Jonah and his uh, Israelite garb and sitting there, sitting in the, you know, with a big smile on his face and the whale smiling. No, Jonah said, I'm in hell. <laughs> Read it, that's what he said, he said I'm in hell. He swallowed alive. He said, I'm in hell. Well, Jonah came to himself. Being swallowed by a whale will kind of cause you to do that, you know. <laughs> what did he do? He acknowledged his sin. He admitted he was wrong. He repented, he repented and confessed his sin. And then God was able to rescue him. So in this case, the way to victory, the way to restoration, the way to deliverance was not to use your faith and use your authority, but was to repent and turn to God. His problem did come because of sin. And sometimes people, sickness, not always, most of the time not, but sometimes people's problems or sickness or financial woes or suffering and pain in their family is caused by sin, unrepented of sin. Proverbs 26, 2, the other side of the coin here, see, says the curse causeless shall not come. And, and, and if you read it in context, because there's another part of it, that, that's the last half of the verse. He's talking about somebody's trying to put a, put a curse on you. It doesn't matter if they're trying to put a curse on you. If, there's no, if they don't have a, if there's no cause, if there's no open door to the devil, because you see the devil is trying to put a curse on us. He's trying to curse us with poor health, curse us in our family, curse us in our finances, curse us in our mind. But he can't, if he doesn't have a cause, he can't put any kind of curse on you. 
But don't think just because you go through some test or trial that you've done something wrong. You know, Jesus and the disciples and many other examples in the Bible, Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, not for doing something wrong. He was thrown in there for doing something right because he prayed to Almighty God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not thrown in the fiery furnace for doing something wrong. They were thrown in there for doing something right. Amen. Glory to God. So don't think you're doing something wrong. But on the other hand, realize and understand the devil can, even as Christians, he can attack us with something and defeat us with something if we're not walking in the light and if we give place to the devil in our life because of sin that's unrepented of, Amen. And he can try to cause things, but it won't stick if we're walking in the light. But if we're not walking in the light, the devil can make it stick. So here's some good advice as we close. Here's some good advice. Anytime you find yourself in a situation where you say, look, I've pulled all the right buttons just like I have in the past, pulled all the right levers spiritually. I'm making the right confessions. I'm using my faith. I I know who I'm in Christ. I'm resisting the devil. I'm standing against the devil. Uh, but, if, but, but if, you, if you're just not getting any results whatsoever and it seems like the devil has access into your life, then stop and check up on yourself. Make sure that you're walking in the light. First thing you ought to do is check up on your love life because the devil will kind of sneak up on you on that. Make sure that you don't have any bitterness or unforgiveness against anybody. Can you say amen? amen. Make sure you're walking in love, not harboring any kind of unforgiveness in your heart against anybody. Make sure that you're walking in the light. Glory to God. So walk in the light. If you sin, if you miss it, if you make a mistake, immediately ask God to fellowship. Brother Hagin, I can hear him now. He used to always say, when you, when you step out from under God's umbrella of protection and you miss it and you sin, just, just, just quit. don't wait. Don't wait through it. Just immediately get back in. Get back, confess, get back in. Get back under the, the light. Glory to God. Stay in fellowship. Keep growing. Keep being a blessing. And keep the door shut on the devil. And if you sin... As a Christian, see, if we sin as a Christian, we can find forgiveness and cleansing by confessing and acknowledging our light, which puts us right back in the light and again keep the door closed on the devil. That's not legalism. That's amazing grace. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace that is the throne of God's favor with confidence and without fear so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help in time of need an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. The microphone. Come ahead, come ahead, baby, come ahead. So walk in the light. Walk in the light. You'll find that things will turn out right. Yes. Don't walk in the dark and stay in the night, but repent, and you'll become light. Joy will enter in to your heart, and then peace and love and contentment, they'll be a part. So come out of the night. Don't stay there and come into the light. Come into the light. There's great love. There's great forgiveness. And there's a great future in store for you if you walk in the light and go forward in the things that I have planned. For they're still available. And you will find them if you come out of the night and come into the light. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Walking in the light. Walk, bow your heads, close your eyes for a minute. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand. Just, just right where you're, you're, you're standing there. If you, if, you, if you have anything, don't dig up anything. Don't let the devil you know, bring up something that you've confessed and it's under the blood of the Lord Jesus. But if there's an area of your life that you're not walking in the light, because you know you can be walking in the light in some areas and not walking in the light of other areas. But if there's an area of your life that you're not walking in the light in, got any unconfessed sin in your life and you know it, amen, just simply, not, this is between you and God, just simply, just say, Father, I, I admit it. I, I'm not going to be stubborn about this. I'm not going to be stupid about this. I'm not going to let the devil keep me from getting back to you through false guilt and condemnation. And just simply say, Lord, I repent. I confess it to you as sin. 
and I ask you to forgive me and I believe that you do. So I thank you that you forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and then forgive yourself and just pick yourself up and go right on walking with God. Amen. There's an old song that came by the Spirit from many, many years ago that said, Walking in the light of God, walking in the light of God, walking in the light of God, I'm walking in the light of God. Simple, isn't it? Walking in the light of God, walking in the light of God, walking in the light of God, I'm walking in the light of God. So walk, walk, walk in the light, walk, walk, walk in the light, walk, walk, walk in the light, walking in the light of God. I'm staying in the light of God, staying in the light of God staying in the light of God staying in the light of God I'm walking in the light of God walking in the light of God walking in the light of God I'm walking in the light of God that's beautiful isn't it First time I ever heard that song, a congregation sang it like for two hours as the Spirit of God fell on that place. Just walking in the light where there is no fright. Glory to God, I'm walking in the light. There's peace in the light. There's joy in the light. There's victory in the light. There's freedom in the light. There's blessings in the light. You're a great blessing to others when you're in the light. Praise God, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, Kalalamanato, in the light, Dalamanusoto, in the light, walking in the light. Where's Kay Dalton? Kay, come up here. I have need to lay hands on you. Amen. <laughs> Lord of God, be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed physically with great strength in the name of Jesus and health and healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. Oh God, walking in the light. Come here, wife. Don't know what I'm going to do. Be blessed. Yeah, that's the anointing of God right there. That was the anointing of God. You feel that going to you? Be blessed. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You're on the right track. You're on the right track. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing it, I'm walking in health. I'm walking in health. Health of God, walking in the health. Of God, walking in the health. Of God, I'm walking in the health of God. I'm walking in the blessings. Walking in the blessings. Of God, walking in the blessings. Of God, walking in the blessings. Of God walking in the blessings of God. I'm right with God. Of God walking in the light. Of God walking in the light. I'm in. I'm in. I'm right with God because of the blood of Jesus. He's my Father. And I have perfect fellowship with Him. Glory to God. I'm going to heaven when I die. I've been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Sin has no more power and dominion over me because I'm walking in the light. I'm walking in the light of truth. I'm walking in the light of the word. I'm walking in the light. Free and healed and whole and delivered by Jesus himself. Glory to you. Walking in the freedom of God. 
Walking in the freedom of God. Walking in the love of God. I'm walking in the joy of God. Walking in the joy of God. Walking in the joy of God. in the name of Jesus. Whatever need to be blessed. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Be blessed. 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 In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Blessing. Be blessed, be blessed. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed in this pregnancy. Be blessed in life, be blessed. <laughs> be blessed. Financial blessings coming your way. Coming your way. You've been faithful. You've been you believe. Financial blessings coming your way. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Hang in there. The Lord says, hang in there. It's not for nothing. Hang in there. It'll be all right. You'll see it. You'll see it. You'll rejoice and you'll be glad that you didn't give up, that you didn't quit, and you stayed true, and you stayed strong. So just walk in the life. Amen. If you make a mistake, ask God to forgive you. You'll be blessed. You are blessed. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Walking in the light of God. Walking in the light. Of God walking in the light of God walking in the light of God. Hallelujah. 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 So the love of both for rest and tiki. What are you gonna do this week? Walk in the light. When you walk in the light, you're always walking right. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Say, I'm walking in the light. In Jesus' name. Well, glory to God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I, I, I feel like I, look, I can lay hands on everybody. Just receive it. Just receive it. Just say, I'm just receive blessing. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And then when you're in the light, don't let the devil steal anything from you. Praise God. Come on, come on, Terry. Come on, Terry. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> so when condemnation comes, when condemnation comes, because we're people, we're people, the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and walk in, uh, in this world so when condemnation comes because you've missed it even a little bit because he wants to make you think you've blown it a bunch when condemnation comes you take exactly what he's been preaching about and what the word of God says you take that by faith you take it by faith you take it you say no, this is mine, not condemnation. We are people, and we need Him. We need Him. We are alive to God, but condemnation is from the evil one, and He wants to still kill and destroy. But you take the fullness of God, the joy of God, the peace of God by faith, even though you don't see it, and the condemnation wants to eat your lunch. You take it by faith because it's yours. It's paid for. The blood of Jesus.
Jesus paid for it. It's yours. Stand on that. Take it and don't let it go. Amen. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I had such a, such a horrible sin consciousness as I grew up in church. And I felt so guilty all the time. I needed that word. You know, don't let the devil do that to you. I'm convinced that half the people that backslide is not just because they're lukewarm and cold-hearted and rebellious against God. They just feel so tremendously guilty and unworthy and the devil drives them away from God and God's saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm on your side. Amen, amen. You want to say something? Come on, come on, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. The Lord gave me a word at such a time where I was feeling very condemned about something. I couldn't even pray. I, my, that fellowship I felt was broken. And so that next morning, before I even had a chance to get up out of bed, I noticed the Bible on the dresser right next to me. I got up, and the Lord gave me the scripture. And it was in Colossians 1, 21. It said, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, that word your was italicized in your mind, not my mind. Yeah. And that word alienated means separated, where the attachment formerly existed. Okay, you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Yes, 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 yes. That gave yes. you such freedom. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Unblameable. That's how God sees you. Unblameable. And un, un, unreprovable. That's how God sees me. Say, I'm not blameable in God's eyes. I, I didn't finish that with you while ago. My mind got in the way because you're my grandson. Be blessed. And in your case, favor is going to bring that blessings. There's going to be great favor on your life concerning every aspect of your life, concerning, concerning your finances and your needs and, and the things you want to do in life and the decisions that you'll be making. Great, you're going to have faith. You have favor with God and great favor with man. Blessings because of the favor are coming your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's it. That's it. That's it. Glory to God. Amen. Turn to somebody right there and say, I'm walking in the light. And you're dismissed. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus.